is first of all to Second Thessalonians chapter two. Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. We read the following in verse one. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. The word here, our gathering together to him, is episunagage, episunagage, where we get the word synagogue. Epi, the Greek prefix, meaning around. Our gathering together to him. Now this idea, it doesn't use the word harpezo, rapture, simply because it's talking about something more than rapture. It's talking about the dead in Christ rising first and those who are raptured meeting then together with the Lord in the air. It is the episunagage. The harpezo speaks specifically of those who are alive who are snatched away. The episunagage speaks of the resurrection as a simultaneous occurrence with the harpezo. When you've got rapture, it is harpezo. When you have rapture plus resurrection, it's episunagage, our gathering around him. The story then continues that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed by either a spirit, a message, or a letter, as if from us to the effect the day of the Lord has already come. Certain things were happening in Thessalonica that the rapture had already taken place. There were people trying to argue that, and it was upsetting the church. There was also a situation of when persecution was impending, some people, maybe believers, maybe non-believers, nobody knows for sure, were standing away from, departing from those who were standing faithful. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasia, the apostasy, comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Different people have different views of this. Most of my friends would disagree with my own view. People like Arnold Fuchtenbaum, Dave Hunt, Thomas Ice, they would take a view that is different than my own. I take it as the most straightforward meaning, that this episode is not going to happen until the faithful can identify the man of lawlessness. The best I can understand the scripture, but he was wisdom count the number of the beast. And if Jesus is our wisdom and we're not here, who's going to have the wisdom to identify him? If the people who are here had wisdom, well, they, would, they wouldn't be here either. <laughs> I just do not see this point of view. Many of my closest friends would disagree. However, I would point out two things. For me, this is a matter for discussion, not a matter for dispute. Where I would dispute is the second thing. Those who deny there is a falling away. Those who deny there is a rapture. My argument is with people, again, like Hank Panagraph. My argument is people with R.C. Sproul. My argument is with post people into Dominion Theology. With those people, I have an argument with my friends who take a different interpretation of this than I do. I have a discussion. Okay. The issue is when you place the rapture, that's open for discussion. The timing of it is open for discussion. But if you say there is none, now I have a problem. Your view is different than mine. I have no problem. Let's talk about it. Let's fellowship about it. Let's pray about it. Let's study the scriptures together. Let's talk about it. You say there is no rapture. We're going to have a fight about it. <laughs> My subject, though, however, is not the rapture. It is the apostasia, the falling away. It has been suggested by a few people, not many, that the apostasia is the rapture. The apostasy, because technically the Greek word could be argued to depart from. The word apo, the prefix apo in Greek means out of. And what it really means is you stand away from. You stand away from others. There will be people who will stand away from others. Those who are holding to the truth will have others who will stand away from them. Quite possibly, or quite likely, in the circumstances the believers faced in Thessalonica, where persecution would be a reason for it happened, many will fall away. Now, when you live in an age when people are saying, you don't have to suffer, you're a king's kid, name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, who do you think is going to fall away when persecution comes? The people being told, you don't have to suffer, you're a king's kid. Beware, the people who follow Benny and Kenny today are the ones who will betray us tomorrow. Do not trust them. They are following the false teachers and false prophets Jesus warned of. Nonetheless, we have the subject of the apostasy, and there are several passages of scriptures that help us to understand this apostasy. One of the most important is 2 Peter. 
Second Peter and First Peter are both concerned with persecution of the church. Both are written to Jews, Jewish believers, and both are concerned with eschatology. In fact, we can say Peter's epistles and Jude are the same. They're written to Jewish believers. Now, that doesn't mean the context doesn't, content doesn't apply to everyone. It simply means we have to understand that who it was written to to understand what it means for us. It was written to Jewish believers, and unless we understand it in that context, it's system name, and we won't properly understand what it means to us. Secondly, they all, both of them talk about persecution. And additionally, they all have an eschatological content and context pointing to things like Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah, things which foreshadow events to come eschatologically. But let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2, please. 2 Peter chapter 2. This chapter is one of the most vital chapters in understanding the days in which we live and in understanding what is going to happen. Again, it's Odokai, pseudo prophetes. Ento leo uskai en umin es ante pseudo dadaskalai. I read the Greek for a reason. False prophets will arise among you as there will be false teachers. Why does Peter use false prophets and false teachers interchangeably? Now notice something. Pseudo dadaskalai. They look like teachers. Pseudo. Pseudo prophetes. They look like prophets. They will come among you, but he uses them as if they were synonyms. Why? If somebody's doctrines are wrong, somebody's prophecies will be wrong. Why do people like Cindy Jacobs, Benny Hinn, and Rick Joyner have an established published record in the public domain for predicting things in God's name that failed to happen? Now, remember Deuteronomy 18 tells us people who predict things in God's name that don't happen are false prophets. The founders of Jehovah's Witnesses, Charles Tazzy Russell, Rutherford, they were false prophets. Joseph Smith and Brigham Young are false prophets. By biblical definition, so was Benny Hinn, so was Rick Joyner, so was Cindy Jacobs. That's what the Word of God says, not Jacob Prash. They predict things in God's name that do not happen that are time-specific. Why do their prophecies not happen? Why are they... False prophets, because they are false teachers. If someone's doctrine is wrong, it's inevitable their predictive prophecies will be wrong. Pseudo. They look like real Bible teachers. They look like real prophets of God, but they're pseudo. And he uses them as if they're some synonyms. He uses a false prophet and a false teacher as if they're interchangeable. If their doctrines are wrong, their prophecies will be wrong. If their prophecies are wrong, it's because their doctrine is off the wall. But then he continues, and he tells us more about these people. He says, Otines parasogzusim, eresis apoleas. Parasogzusim. A difficult word to translate, so they translate it as a phrase. Para is the Greek prefix, meaning next to, next to. Paramedic, paramilitary, paralegal. And eresis. Parasoxusin. They put truth next to error. They take something that's true and use it to camouflage something false. They put a lie in the packaging of something that is true. They put truth next to error. The Hebrews were not allowed to make a garment of flax and wool. If you've been to Turkey, to the seven churches of Leo, uh, Revelation, you've been to Laodicea, you see the hot springs coming down from Pamukkala through the Roman viaduct. Feeding the hot springs, the cold springs, and the lukewarm springs with the two waters mixed around Laodicea. you got the hot and the cold but then you've got the lukewarm with the two mixed. 
What does Jesus say about the mixture? But today you have a lie being propagated. Sometimes the people who propagate the lie don't know it's a lie. They're simply ignorant. Let few of you be teachers. Teachers will be judged more strictly than the rest. James 3.1, we stand before Jesus. I am going to be held more accountable than most of you. Chew the meat. Spit out the bones. Just take the good. Well, I know there's some wrong things in Toronto. I know there's some wrong things in Pensacola. But there's also some good things. We have to take the good and throw away the bad. Parasolzusin. So you take some tea, and into the tea you put a few drops of arsenic, and you have a homogeneous solution, and you say, well, I'm just going to drink the tea and spit out the arsenic. <laughs> Lukewarm water. Did Jesus say, well, I'm just going to swallow the cold or swallow the hot and spit out the lukewarm? It just doesn't work that way. When you listen to somebody telling you that stuff, just chew the meat and spit out the bones, you're listening to somebody who's one of two things. At best, they're a babbling ignoramus. They're a biblically illiterate ignoramus, at best. At worst, they're an intentional deceiver. Either way, they're deceiving others. It is a false teaching. Eresis comes from the Greek, the root of the Greek word eresis, you get the word heresy, is Iran. It means to take one thing out. The way heresy works is people take one text out of context and make it a pretext upon which they build the schism. That's what heresy means. They take one text out of context, make it a pretext, and upon that they make a schism. That is heresy. But they do it by putting truth next to error. And this is something that becomes worse eschatologically as we get closer to the return of Jesus. Now we read about these people. They'll bring swift destruction upon themselves, apelon. This word apelon is found in the book of Revelation. It was a Greek mythical monster, the destroyer. Many will follow their sensuality in verse 2, and because of them the way of the truth will be maligned. Many will follow because of sensuality. Sensuality means you're governed by senses. We have to understand the way the apostasy will work. It comes down to a simple principle of spiritual seduction. It's like this. Biblically, we are tripartite beings. We're made in God's image and likeness. We're three-dimensional. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit that's why Paul says, Know ye not ye are temples of the Holy Spirit. The outer court of the temple corresponds to our body. Hebrew, Guf. Greek, Soma. The outer court of the temple. Everybody can see our physical body. But then the inner court of the temple corresponds to our soul, our consciousness, our mind, our emotions, our intellect. Soul. The holy place. Greek, psuche. Hebrew, nephesh. It's onomatopoeia in Hebrew. You don't call it onomatopoeia in, in Hebrew, but in English you'd call it that. The word sounds like what it is. God breathed on Adam, he became a living soul. It sounds like respiration. <sighs> that fish. <sighs> Adam, Adam had a living soul. Animals have a soul, they have breath. Koran, Shammat, and Halal, that everything that has breath praise the Lord, but they don't have a living soul. God did not breathe on them. But then we have the innermost man or woman. That is the spirit where God's spirit dwells. Hebrew, Ruach, Greek, pneuma, as in pneumonia, pneumatic drill. Okay. Body, soul, and spirit. 
For instance, when someone is demonically oppressed, you have a demonic attack or incursion into the body and the soul. That's demonic oppression. The word for dealing with demonic oppression in Greek is always therapeo, therapeo, therapy, heal. When you have demonic possession, instead of the Holy Spirit being inside someone's spirit, there's a demon. That is possession, and it's a different Greek word, ekbalo, you get the word ballistic, to cast out, throw out. No place in the Bible is the word ekbalo ever used in connection with a born-again Christian. The apostles never taught casting demons out of believers, never. Now, demonic oppression, Paul was demonically oppressed. Yes, Christians can be demonically oppressed, but you're healed of demonic oppression. Casting demons out of believers, do what I do. Now, bear in mind, I myself believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. I'm not a cessationist. When you see a church that has a deliverance service, pick up the phone, give them a ring. Hello, you guys have a deliverance service tonight? Yeah. Good. Send over two cheeseburgers or onions. Don't forget the coleslaw. <laughs> it's not biblical. We are body, soul, and spirit. However, when you have a prophecy, a revelation of God, is it the Holy Spirit communicating with our spirit that we understand with the mind, or is it something that originates in the mind? A revelation from God can either be a revelation from God, Holy Spirit communicating to our spirit. It can be the product of our own mind, or it can be of demonic origin. Now let's understand this. Jeremiah said this, they prophesied from the futility of their own mind. Look at Hebrews 4.12. The word of the God is active, sharper than a two-edged sword, separating bone from marrow, flesh from spirit. When you do a leukemia transplant, a, trans a marrow transplant for leukemia patients, You've got a problem. The erythrocytes, the red cells, are concentrated in marrow of big bones. So you've got osteocytes, which are bone cells, erythrocytes, which are red blood cells. But when the two come together, you have something that dye stains sort of like a rust color. It's difficult to tell where the erythrocytes begin and the osteocytes end. It's done with a micrometer. It's done microsurgically. How do you tell the difference? You need a very fine surgical instrument. Well, what Hebrews 4 tells us is the relationship between the mind and the spirit is the same. Is that really the spirit? Is that the Holy Spirit speaking? Or is that just my own head? You need a very fine surgical instrument to distinguish between the two. And that instrument is the Word of God. The Word of God tells us Test that prophecy, test that revelation, test that teaching. <laughs> well, this is important. People are governed by sensuality. In Greek, the fruit of the Spirit is again ekrete, self-control. If somebody's not in control of themselves, as we said the other night, God's not in control. An alcoholic gets saved, he goes out to a bar, begins hitting the bottle again. Backsliding into alcohol. is. God in control of him or her? No. Why? They're not in control of themselves. If God is not in control, we're not in control. And if we're not in control, God's not in control. Oh, I know it was God. I couldn't. I saw people who this in Toronto, Canada. I know it was God. I couldn't control it. By virtue of the fact you couldn't control it, proves it couldn't possibly be God. But they don't judge biblically. It's only the mind. A lot of what you see today, people falling down, supposedly slain in the spirit, does not resemble what happens in the Bible when that phenomenon takes place. Most of what you see today is a combination of hypnotic induction and demonic deception. Most of it is demonic deception combined with hypnotic induction. That's all it is. Stage hypnotists can do the same thing. John was in the spirit in the Lord's day, and he fell as a slain. It was a once-in-a-lifetime life-changing event. In the Bible, whenever it happened, and it didn't happen much, the people always went forward and worshipped to God. The only time they ever fell backward is when they came to arrest Jesus. <laughs> to begin with, these guys had professional catches. They're falling the wrong way. I know it's God! He must be angry at you. You're falling in the wrong direction. 
in the Bible, it's a once-in-a-lifetime, life-changing experience. John didn't want it to happen again. Daniel didn't want it to happen again. God had to send an angel to encourage them. Don't be afraid. These guys get back in line. Weren't you up here a half hour ago? Yeah, now I have a headache. When it really happened in the Bible, it was a picture of regeneration, new birth. Understand the Midrash, the typology. You had that kid, when his father tells Jesus, when Satan grabs him and throws him in the fire. The power of Jesus comes on this kid, and they fell down and they thought the kid was dead. But he gets up and Satan, could no, the demon, can no longer throw him in the fire, remember? That's the picture of us. We die with Christ, but his power comes upon us, and we're born again. We die with him, we get up new creation. Satan can no longer throw us in the fire. It's a picture of salvation. It's a once-in-a-lifetime, life-changing event. In the Bible, it doesn't matter what happens when people go down. How different is their life when they get up? Or how different are these people's lives when they get up today? It's no different. They get back in line again. It's all a con job. It's a religious con. But what predisposes people to this religious con artistry? Sensuality. They confuse feeling and emotion with spirituality. Proverbs warns about this. Three places in Proverbs were warned about people who do this. They confuse spirituality with sensuality. They're confusing the suke. It's psychology. That's all it is, psychological manipulation. When people are prone to psychological manipulation, they're going to be suckers for spiritual deception. It is no coincidence today that there's less and less expository preaching and exegesis in the church. More and more motivational speaking, anecdotes, and stories. It's a con, and it's a con we're told to beware of. Promise keepers psychologize the men of Christian America. James Dobson psychologized the women of Christian America. And Robert Schuller psychologized the pastors of Christian America. It's a con. Now, there is biblical psychology. Biblical psychology is called the book of Proverbs. Proverbs understands we're three-dimensional, made in God's image and likeness. Secular psychology, Darwinian, uh, doesn't matter if it's Freudian or Jungian, it all comes from Darwin, says we're two-dimensional. We're simply apes with better DNA. Eastern religion and psychology confuse the soul with the spirit. It says we're two-dimensional. The Bible says we're three-dimensional. We're made in the image and likeness of a triune God. There is biblical psychology. You want to understand human behavior, read the book of Proverbs. Now let's go further with this. God breathed on Adam, he became a living soul. Mental illness never originates in the mind. What people are is a product of what we are organically, physically, physiologically, with what we are spiritually. We have a living soul. When someone is mentally ill, there's either something wrong with that person organically, chemically, hormone imbalance, reaction to a drug, fever causing delirium, behavior ab abnormality, Clinically, clinically abnormal behavior will either be caused by something organically wrong or something spiritually wrong. Psychology is a pseudoscience and it's a pseudo-theology. You understand? Proverbs is biblical psychology. It tells us we are three-dimensional. You want to understand human behavior, read Proverbs. Forget about psychology. It's all garbage, but it's infiltrated the church. Secondly, we're told in Colossians, look out for the philosophies of the world. They are in the church. Consumerism. Existentialism, postmodernism. Now, there is a biblical philosophy. If you want to read biblical philosophy, read the book of Ecclesiastes. That's God's book of philosophy. It's futile to trust in this life. It's all vanity. Love God and keep his commandments. That's God's philosophy of life. You don't need Nietzsche, Freud, Schopenhauer, Spinoza, Hobbes, Locke. There is biblical philosophy, and there's biblical psychology. Unfortunately, too much of the contemporary church, including the evangelical church, has turned from biblical psychology to secular. They're teaching psychology using Christian jargon. That's all it is. And they've turned from a biblical worldview to the philosophies of the world. That's the emergent church, postmodernism. We are three-dimensional, but this is how the apostasy works. When people are prone to sensuality, they fall into it. Let's go back now and continue with Second Peter. 
Many will fall, and the way of truth will be maligned. In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Notice there's a financial motive. The people who teach error have a financial incentive for doing so. Joyce Meyer has a financial motive. I saw a video of that terrible woman in Australia several weeks ago. I couldn't believe it. We have two Greek words for a receipt. One is to telestai, means paid in full. It's the word that John's Gospel uses when Jesus dies, paid in full. The other is arbanon. Arbanon. It's the word used for the Holy Spirit being the pledge of our salvation. It's like God has bought us with the blood of Jesus, and, and the Holy Spirit is like the receipt that proves that, we, that he owns us. So there's a Greek word, Kabbalah, but it's not even relevant. She actually says, she's actually teaching people on this video, that when you give something to God, meaning to her ministry financially, God gives you a receipt. And that you can, when you want something, you go to God and give him the receipt, you owe me this. God is no man's debtor. He, he doesn't owe us anything. We owe him everything. He owes us nothing. But to tell us by means that Jesus paid our debt in full. That's the receipt. Or Arbanon, the Holy Spirit is the receipt proving that we've been bought by the blood of Christ. That woman is a heretical liar. She has a lying spirit. Who follows her? People given to sensuality. But she looks like a real Bible teacher. Pseudo the Daskali. And she has a financial motive. You know how much money that woman makes by prostituting the word of God to line her own pockets? Just one example. Let's continue. The way of truth will be maligned. I love this. With false words. The term here for false words in Greek, it is amazing. Logos. Now, Jesus is the Logos. NRK Kaiho Logos. In the beginning was the Word. Hebrew, the Vod. The Vod of the Nye. The Word of the Lord is Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God incarnate. The Bible is Jesus in published form. Static relationship. He's the Logos. They have a plastic one. So we get the word plastic. The Greek word for meaning fabricated from where we get the word plastic. This is wood. How do you get one of Formica and make masonite that would look just like it? But it would be a fabrication. It looks real, but it wouldn't be wood. This has components that are metallic and ones that are plastic. But at a distance, the plastic looks metallic. It's plastios. It's fabricated. Those who engage in this financial seduction and who corrupt the word of God will have a plastic Bible. They'll read the message. They'll read some perverted paraphrase. They will engage in proof texting. Instead of beginning with the word of God to look at a situation from the perspective of Scripture, they will come with their presuppositions and try to find a Scripture that supports it. But since Scripture doesn't support it, they'll have to go to a paraphrase. <laughs> they'll get a plastic Bible. That's why the purpose-driven Rick Warren uses the message. It's because the Word of God doesn't teach what he does. This is how the apostasy works. They get a plastic Bible. You get people not to discern, to be led by sensuality, confusing that which is of the flesh, which is of the spirit, don't discern it. You're judging. You're being critical. Let's go back to Hebrews 4.12. You know what that word is? The judge between the flesh and spirit? The word there is kritikos. Kritikos. We are commanded to have a critical spirit. What Joyce Meyer teaches is not biblical. You have a critical spirit. I certainly hope so. I certainly hope so. You better have a critical spirit. 
Not finding fault, but judging if something is scriptural. Judging if it is purely from the mind or if it is from the Spirit of God. And as of the Spirit of God, it will be in accordance with the Word of God. We are commanded to have a critical spirit. Don't take your Greek lessons from Joyce Meyer. Let's continue. Peter then goes on talking about eschatology, about things that will happen in the end that are prefigured or foreshadowed by things that happened in the past. Angels who did not keep their rightful abode, the story of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah, the rise of militant homosexuality as in the days of Lot, again happens eschatologically. These past events foreshadow what's going to happen at the end. The rescue of Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah is a picture of the rapture. It's one of the things that before the, before the destruction comes, God's people are rescued out. One of the phenomena that's going to happen again is a rise in homosexuality and lesbianism. It's happening now. Now, hand in hand with this goes Jude. Turn with me, please, to Jude chapter 10. I'm sorry, Jude verse 10. What am I saying? Oti de osa, men ok, odasin, vrasime osin. Ose de fusikos, natural. Oste eloga zoe epistante. These men revile what they don't understand. And that word revile is the word blaspheme. They're blaspheming something. You cannot blaspheme anything other than which is of God. The Torah's witnesses try to say that the Holy Spirit is a power or a force. You can't grieve a force and you can't blaspheme a force. They are blaspheming something. And they're blaspheming something they don't understand. But what is the word here? What is the term? The term is quite an incredible term. I'll read it again very carefully. These men revile, literally blaspheme, whatever they do not understand. Okay. And by those things they know by instinct as irrational animals do, by these things, they are destroyed. Now this tells us something. The word here about what these people are doing, like unreasoning animals, is a loga. A loga. Not logical. It's not logical. Their arguments are not logical. Not even reasonable. They reason in an animalistic way. What does Jude mean? Let's go back to understand the beginning again. We are tridimensional. Animals are bidimensional. Animals have souls, but not living souls. They don't have a spirit. These people think two-dimensionally. They reason like animals. They respond to sensuality, to instinct, to compulsion. I want more of God, more of God. It's not God. But they're so sensual and driven by compulsion, it's like an animal. Throw the dog a bone. Forget if it's coated in arsenic, the, bone, the dog doesn't know. doesn't care. All he sees is the bone. And you can't reason with these people from the Scripture because they don't think reasonably. They think animalistically. Remember, the mind of a beast was given to Nebuchadnezzar. I've actually seen videos of people in Toronto, Canada, and Pensacola, Florida, on the floor imitating animals. I saw videos of Kenneth Hagen, the late Kenneth Hagen. They were imitating snakes. I know it was God! The mind of a beast was given. This is a judgment. They behave like animals because they reason like animals. They become what the Darwinists say they are, monkeys with better DNA.
They behave like a phylogenetically inferior species because they confuse the flesh with the spirit. A loga, there is no logic. Jeremiah was up against the same phenomena in his day when judgment was looming. Turn with me, please, to the Old Testament, very briefly to Jeremiah chapter 8. Let's begin in chapter 4, sorry. Yermiyahu Hanavi. Remember, as we said last night, the last days of Judah and the times of Jeremiah prefigure what happens in the last days to all of us. And Jeremiah says this in chapter 4. Verse 22. My people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. Now the word here, stupid, is a very crude word in English. In Hebrew, the word is avil. You know what avil means in Hebrew? Remember, Jude is also writing to Jews. They pervert their logic to justify that which is not logical. They pervert their logic. You mean the image of the of God? Why are you behaving like a baboon? They have to pervert their logic. My people are stupid. It doesn't mean congenitally stupid. It means stupid and proud of it. It means a moron by choice. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 5. Then I said, they're only the poor, the foolish. They don't know the way of the Lord, the ordinance of God. I'll go speak to the great ones. They know the way of the Lord and the ordinance of God. I'll go to them. They'll listen. But they don't listen either. They don't know, and they don't want to know. They're just as bad. Pastors don't want to know. Let's continue. Let's go further with this. Jeremiah chapter 10, please. Sorry, chapter 5. Look at the end of it. An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land in verse 30. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests, the clergy rule on their own authority, and my people love it so. The people want to follow these deceivers. What does Paul say in Timothy in the last days? Wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate teachers in accordance with their own desire. They want Benny, Kenny, and Joyce. They want the emergent church. There's a market for the product because they're in rebellion against God. So they will pervert their logic. Jeremiah chapter 10. Verse 8, they're altogether stupid because they're making these images. Verse 14, every man is stupid. Now it is not the Roman Catholic Church, the Mormons, and the Greek Orthodox with their icons and images. Now it's the emergent church. Now there's evangelicals following Thomas Merton, following Chuck Fromm. This is stupidity. God calls it stupidity. It is biblically stupid. They pervert their logic. They think like monkeys. That's how the apostasy happens. But then Jude really gets going. Let's go back to Jude, please. Woe to them, they walked the way of Cain, abandoned themselves for the sake of the gain of Balaam's error, and perished in Korah's rebellion. Cain, carnal believers will always persecute spiritual ones like Cain persecuted Abel. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 23. For the sake of gain, a financial motive, just like Balaam, Peter says the same thing. And they go in the rebellion of Korah. They organize the people to turn against those who teach the truth. But we're told about these people that they become engaged in disputes, disputes, 
Now, what are these disputes these people get involved in? What are these disputes? And in the dispute of Korach, the word here is, in Greek, antilogia. Remember, Jesus is the Logos. Anti in Greek, the prefix means not only against, but co-equally in place of. Anti logia. Their reasoning is not logical, but what they dispute, they put something in place of the logos, in word in place of the word of God. They will argue from psychology. They will argue from marketing, from Peter Drucker. They'll find some other source. They'll have some other basis of doctrinal authority in place of the logos. They'll get an antilogia. They'll get purpose-driven. They'll get anything. As long as it's a pseudo-logos, an anti-logos, something they can put in place of Scripture. One, they will not argue logically. Reasonably. They can't reason from the Scripture. And two, they'll have some other basis of authority other than Scripture for what they're propagating. Prayer of Jabez or the God Chasers, some other book. That'll be their guide. The Promise Keepers had a book called The Masculine Journey. So with their imprimatur on it, Jesus Christ was tempted to have sex with other men. He was a phallic male. When your child loses their virginity and comes home stoned on drugs for the first time, instead of condemning them, it's time to shake their hand and congratulate the next generation for being human. This is what Promise Keepers teaches. In their workbook, other men have the right to question what you do in marital intimacy with your wife sexually. Unsaved men might go to a bar and get drunk and mouth off what he did with the waitress they picked up last night, but even unsaved men wouldn't talk about marital intimacy with other men with, the, with, with their wife. Even unsaved men wouldn't do that low. It takes the promise keepers to do something so vile and disgusting. Nobody's business what you do with your wife or your husband. Promise keeper says, is, they're the men of integrity. If the men of, no, they're not the men of integrity. Promise keepers is for filthy perverts, for blaspheming perverts. It's their own book, and I can prove it. They have an antilogia. That's all psychology. That's what it was based on, psychology. Two-dimensional humanism. Now, both in Peter and in Jude, it sets the stage for what follows. In both cases, it specifically speaks of Sodom and Gomorrah. I live in Britain. The Anglican Church, the Church of England, the Methodist Church, the United Reformed Church, the Church of Scotland, the Presbyterian Church, they're all ordaining homosexuals. There's a church in California that's evangelical that had Barry Taylor, the homosexual advocate, preaching in it. If I told you which church, you'd be shocked. The following Brian McLaren. He said we should declare a five-year moratorium on debating same-sex marriage and homosexual and lesbian ordination. Then we should decide. The church should decide. What authority does the church have to decide something God has already decided? If God decided it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, how can the church appropriate to itself the authority to change it? But that's what he's saying. In other words, what McLaren is teaching is, the church wrote the Bible. The church can rewrite it. It used to be liberals who said that. Now it's so-called evangelicals. Now it's the Bill Hybels, Rick Warren, Brian McLaren. You understand? Once you get into this stuff, the A-Loga, once you get into the anti-Logos, once you get into not discerning, you set yourself up for a moral landslide into open perversion, blasphemy, and ultimately idolatry. That is how the apostasy of the last thing works. And it's happening. 
I won't bore you with any more Greek. I only do it when it's necessary. I study the scriptures in Greek and Hebrew myself, but sometimes it's just the best way to explain things. I hope you'll forgive me if you hate foreign languages. I know some people do. It wasn't necessary. I wouldn't have. Nonetheless, turn with me, please, to Second Timothy. Chapter 3, it describes what society will be like in the last days. Difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self. That's psychology right there. Lovers of self, consumerism, Peter Drucker, purpose-driven. In other words, what church is going to meet your needs? Agape love puts God first, others second, and yourself last. Biblically, the question is, what church is God going to use you to meet the need of others? <laughs> But it's consumerism. Where did I get this? Peter Drucker, an unsaved merchandising expert in advertising and marketing. That's where it comes from. And they get it from personality profiling, the shape thing, psychology and marketing. This becomes their basis of doctrine and anti-logos. Lovers of self. What church will meet your needs? Lovers of Money. Yes, friends, I want each and every one of you to open up your heart and open up your wallet and show me how much you love the Lord Jesus. Can you say amen? Then it goes on saying what society is going to be like, but then it goes on to verse 8, like Jonathan and John Braves opposed Moses. These men opposed the truth, men of depraved minds. Who were Jonathan and John Braves? Pharaoh's magicians. What did they do? Counterfeit signs and wonders. They counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron. In other words, the way Jonathan and John Braves counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron is the way the Antichrist and false prophet are going to counterfeit the miracles of Jesus and his witnesses. There are two ways the Antichrist will deceive, two primary ways. One are counterfeit signs and wonders. Now, counterfeit does not necessarily mean they're bogus. They may be bogus, but they could mean the spiritual power on back of it, the way it's done, by which power it's done. Jesus warned us of something. The Vineyard Movement taught the lie. The Vineyard Movement that Chuck Smith kicked out of Calvary was based on a lie. Signs and wonders that seem to nifle out to the key to belief. Well, again, an anti logos. John 10, Jesus said, For which one of these signs do you stone me? Biblically, it's these signs follow. A wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. We warned about that the other night. When you judge biblically, they call you a legalist. No, they're the legalist. Remember, the Antichrist. So the man of lawlessness is revealed, the anthropon a nomon. They don't want the law of God. They want their own. Once you pervert your logic, a loga, and once you go into anti-logos, you get another basis of doctrinal authority. You are lawless. You've rejected the law of God. You are already following the spirit of Antichrist. So when the anthropon a nomon comes, you're sitting duck for it. In other words, as the Holy Spirit draws people to Christ, the spirit of Antichrist draws people to Antichrist. The same as the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church for the return of Christ, the spirit of Antichrist is preparing the apostate church for the dawn of the Antichrist. This stuff is serious. These are dangerous men. Paul goes on to say in 2 Timothy, they are deceiving and being deceived. They deceive themselves and they deceive others. But then he points again to Scripture. Verse 16, all Scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We have a heretic and a false prophet in England called General Coates, who speaks of the inadequacy of Scripture. And again, he's one of these guys who predicts things that don't happen, like earthquakes. For the time will come, in verse 3, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves Morris Cirillo, Kenneth Copeland, and Andre Paul Crouch, 
who will turn away their ears to myths away from the truth. Verse 5, but you be drunk in the spirit like Rodney Howard Brown and go to Toronto. You be sober. Endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist. Be instant in season and out of season. This stuff was going to come in the last days, and it is here exactly in the form we're told it would come. This is the apostle. Remember, if they cannot see through Benny, Kenny, and Joyce, they're never going to see through real deception. What is going to happen when real deception comes? But there's more. There is another way the Antichrist is going to take people for a ride. If possible, the elect will be deceived. There are two people, and only two, who are called the son of perdition. Judas and the Antichrist. Only those two. Many people are demonically possessed. But there's only two people who are satanically possessed. Judas and Satan entered him, and the Antichrist. Then a demon, there's Satan possessed. There's a difference. Both the son of perdition, them and them alone, both satanically possessed, both into money. And when the Apostle John describes Antichrist, he says, they went out from among us, but they were not really of us. He describes Antichrist in the character of Judas. Whenever you see something about Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition, the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us something about the Antichrist who's coming and who may already be alive. I don't know, but I know this. Turn with me to John 12. Let's see what Jesus is telling us. Verse 4. They take the pound of very costly perfume and nard and put it in the loin Jesus' feet. She and wipes his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, Yehuda Iscariot, means a suburbanite, literally in Hebrew, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii, given to the poor? Now this he said because he was con- not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a crook. Now notice it's Judas here. Let's look at this in the synoptic accounts. Turn with me to Mark 14.4. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why this waste, this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii. It was not just Judas. It begins with him. He persuades others to say the same thing. Now let's look at Matthew 26, verse 8. But the disciples were indignant why this waste that might have been sold for a high price and given to the poor. Now everybody's saying it. Remember, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Not until Jesus revealed him did the apostles know who he was. <laughs> this guy's going to be good. This guy is going to be real good. Yes, he will use signs and wonders. Revelation tells us that. Matthew 24 tells us that. Paul tells us that in Thessalonica and Timothy. Signs and wonders is the first thing. But the second thing is the icing on his cake. He's going to be a wonderful humanitarian. People are going to think he's Albert Schweitzer, Mother Teresa, and Jesus Christ rolled into one. Look how he cares for the poor and disenfranchised. In fact, he only uses the cause of the poor and disenfranchised for his own aggrandizement to ingratiate himself with people, to con them. This guy is going to look like such a wonderful humanitarian. How dare you speak against such a wonderful man of God? I remember Mother Teresa of Calcutta three months before she died said she didn't have the assurance of salvation. I watched the documentary on PBS of her here in America. I was in the States at the time when she got the Nobel Prize. She actually said she doesn't convert Hindus and Muslims to be Christians. She converts them to be better Hindus and better Muslims. How do you convert somebody to be a better Muslim? Give them a hand grenade? 
This was her gospel. The woman was not a Christian. She encouraged people to worship demon gods. Other gods are demons, Paul says. The mono in Greek, Moses calls them demons, Shadim in Hebrew. I'm the Lord your God. You'll have no other gods before me. Ramla, Krishna, Shiva, these are demons. She converts people to be better demon worshippers. How dare you say that about Mother Teresa, this wonderful Christian saint of God? I didn't say it about Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa said it about Mother Teresa. They have to pervert their logic, don't they? They can't look at what she actually said and deal with it. They have to pervert their logic. You know them by their fruits. Yeah, pick up a poor person off the streets of Calcutta, clean them up, give them a place to die with dignity, and send them off to hell in a laundry chute. Into a crisis eternity. If you can't see through Mother Teresa, what's going to happen when this guy comes doing miracles? But notice how it all begins. Sensuality. Wanting to have their ears picked. Not discerning, not thinking rationally, a loga, not basing their beliefs biblically, anti logos. Once that happens, the rest is inevitable. I knew when the laughing and drunken phenomena happened in Toronto and Pensacola, I said, This is it. If people will believe this, they'll believe anything. There's nothing they won't believe now. The emergent churches of God, the man, he says we can't condemn homosexuality. But it goes way before that. We got to the point now where there's other Christs. Other Christ, Jesus said. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. Our Christ, the real Christ, said, he will come back physically the way he went, as we looked at the other night, to the Mount of Olives. He does not come back in the Eucharist. You do not pray to a piece of bread and a cup of wine. They worship that as Christ physically incarnate come to earth. That's another Christ. The Roman Catholic Church, their blessed sacrament, as they call it, is another Christ. The Mormons say that Jesus is the brother of Satan. They have prophecies that the President of the United States one day would be a Mormon. Pat Robinson endorses Romney, had him give the commencement address at his Christian seminary. You've got people like Craig Blomberg, Craig Hazen from Biola University, Richard Moo of Fuller Theological Cemetery. And of all people, Ravi Zacharias speaking in Mormon temples without drawing a distinction between our Jesus and theirs. He just talks about Jesus. But he doesn't say that you have a different Jesus than we do. This is a man I once respected. Another Christ. Well, another Christ is really coming. If they'll get in bed with Rome, if they'll get in bed with the Mormons, if major evangelical leaders will call Sun Young Moon, a man who says he's the return of Christ, a great hero, and they've done it, What's going to happen when the real other Christ comes? If you get in bed with Moon or the Pope, if you get in bed with the Mormons, you're already in bed with people who have another Christ. This is the apostasy. I don't say the apostasy is coming. It is already begun already begun and I have great fear we all have fear for our unsaved loved ones but now I see denominations are backsliding whole denominations are turning away from Christ Ordaining homosexuals. The Methodists have nothing to do with John Wesley. Most Baptists have nothing to do with people like Charles Spurgeon anymore, certainly not in England where I live. Apostasy. 
They stand apart from those who stand for the truth. Apostasy. But then there's the big lie. A false unity. Jesus prayed we would be one. Yeah, but he prefaced the prayer by saying, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is true. Unity of the spirit depends on truth. We are not to be one with those who don't believe the truth. We're told in 1 Corinthians 11, 19, there must be factions. Heresies, heresy, same word, among you to prove which is true. You see people going with this purpose-driven junk, this emergent church junk, this ecumenical junk, this faith prosperity junk. They are not true. But there must be these heresies to prove which is. May God in his grace keep us faithful until that day. And that day is coming soon. God bless.